Peregrine Capital was founded in 1998 and is South Africa's longest running hedge fund manager. The company currently manages investor assets of approximately 12 billion rand through its two local flagship hedge funds. They also offer a long only offshore equity fund. We are going to focus on Peregrine's high growth fund today. It is the first South African fund to achieve a hundred times investment return. If you invested 1 million rand in the fund in February 2000, it was worth more than 100 million rand at the end of February this year. Let me say that again. If you invested 1 million rand in 2000, you'd have more than 100 million rand today. In comparison, if you invested 1 million rand in a fund tracking the JSE capped SWIX All Share Index, it would have grown to only 14 million rand. Jacques Conradi joins me now. He is the CEO and a portfolio manager at Peregrine Capital. Jacques, thank you so much for joining us. A hundred bagger, that doesn't happen often. Tell us the story about the fund. So um, the high growth fund rate was started um, by Dave Fraser and Clive Nates. Dave is still one of the fund managers um, with us in, in 2000. And initially that specific fund was almost to, to run staff's own money. It was basically we're going to invest in our very best ideas here, try to compound um, as well as we can over the long term while also trying to manage risk. Because I think a key part of compounding is not having big drawdowns. So manage the risk invest in our best ideas and compound as, as fast as we can. Uh, so eventually it started off as internal money and then friends and family um, and, and other contacts joined over time and the, the fund kind of started pretty naturally and then um, fortunately it's kind of worked out as well or, or better than we, we ever would have hoped over the last um, 22 or 23 years. Um, and the goal is really to, to, to keep delivering those kind of returns for investors. Are there still some of the original investors still invested today? Yes, so both Dave and Clive, that was the initial fund managers, are, are still invested. I've obviously been invested since, let's say, seven when I joined. But the two of them um, and, and, and Peregrine Group still have some money in that's been there, in, in there from, from day one, effectively, yes. And it's a, a long, short fund? Yes, yeah. so it's, it's long short equity, um, mostly focused on South Africa with the ability to utilize offshore shares, um, to invest in offshore shares. And really what it comes down to is going along the companies we really like that we think is going to outperform the market and deliver great results for, for investors over an extended period. Um, and then going short businesses against that that we think will either underperform or that will protect the positions um, on your long side. Um, and, and then if we look at our long positions, we typically are somewhat more medium and long-term investors than, than some hedge funds might be. We're not really a trading fund that's in there for a few weeks. Typically, when we look at a new position, we have a two-year time horizon when we look at it. So a lot of our returns have come from picking great companies that's just going to do well over an extended period of time. But many fund managers would say that. So listen, let's uh, pick great companies and stay invested for a long time. Why did this uh, you know, increase with 100 times and many other funds don't? I think that that is a fantastic, fantastic question. And it really comes down to where does the return come from? And um, what I always tell people, it's, it's not just one or two things, right? If it was just this, this long-term time horizon, like I said, a lot of people would say that then, then everyone would have the same track records. But in fact, there's very, in our opinion, very few track records, if, if any, like ours. And you do that, in my opinion, by getting many things consistently, right? It's, it's not an industry where there's a sil one silver bullet that if you do this, you're gonna outperform. Like we say, you gotta have like 50 lead bullets handy and, and, and go at it that way. So it's just ticking off many things Correctly. So firstly, it starts with doing the deep bottom up fundamental research. But again, m many people would say that we think we do it exceptionally well. And there's case studies of just how deep we go on companies, how many meetings we would have with the companies, but also their competitors, also their clients. So literally kind of looking under every rock to, to look for the extra piece of info that gives us um, the advantage. So that is a vital part of it. But then also being open that controlling your emotions is a key part of generating that out, out performance. Because even in companies you like, there's going to be times where the market sells them off for no reason. And I think we're, we're in the middle of this Russian crisis. So it's kind of, we're going through that right now. Um, and I think it really indicates why you've got to have stable emotions. You've got to know what you're invested in. You've got to know the value of that company. And when the share falls 20 or 30%, that let's say a Nuspers or, or something that's happened recently, you've got to be pegged very firmly in what you know that company is worth. And then you've got to not, not panic when things are down. You've got to be 
be willing to buy on the way down, even though you know you're going to take some further drawdown. Um, that's so, so managing your emotions is another absolutely vital part of, of being a good investor. Now, obviously, there's many other things um, that we can go into here, but I think maybe the, 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 the doing the detailed research, putting in the time, but then be realizing that it's also an emotional game is, is two of the key parts. Yeah, we'll talk about the volatility and the emotions in a minute, but just take us back. The, the original uh, focus of the fund um, and the investment methodologies uh, that drove the, the investment approach, did that ever change over the years? I, I think it's been actually fairly consistent throughout this entire 23-year period. And, and really what it comes down to is the additional tool set that a hedge fund has versus a long only. So one of our kind of staple ways of, of making outperformance that's not available to long only funds is finding companies that's winners in sectors and betting against uh, or going short other companies in the sector. So for a very long period of time, we had a position on where we went long Capitec and short a basket of some of the other banks. Because we just saw at that stage Capitec at 1% of transactional banking. Uh, several of us in the office for ourselves, for our wives, we opened accounts. We saw um, this product is as good or better than the um, the big bank products, their service is excellent and the pricing is much cheaper. Um, so being able to then have a big position there and hedge that with the other banks is key because it basically means you can take out the banking sector volatility out of the trade and just capture the individual stock upside, which a long only fund, they, they can own Capitec, but um, it's going to be hard for them to own it in that size and hedge out the sector risk of that. So basically using this hedge fund tool set taking advantage of those pair trades is vital and then also keeping the business a boutique size business so we've had many clients over the years wanting to give us sizable long only mandates um, in SA equities and we've said it's important for us to stay um, quick and nimble where we can take advantage of market mispricings quickly move from one opportunity to the next so having that speed um, within I think a team that knows companies very well are a few things that go into there and to be honest, that, that's been absolutely consistent since, since the day we started. I mean, Dave's still one of the fund, key fund managers with, with me in the business, so it's really nothing has changed. Obviously, you learn lessons along the way, and it's a key part of our philosophy is learning from mistakes. Because as an investor, even if you've been doing this for 20 years, we think you get two or three out of 10 calls right. Um, sorry, two, out of, two or three out of 10 calls wrong, and hopefully you get six or seven right. That's just how this industry or this game works because you're dealing with, with the future here. But if you can learn from every mistake you make and just get slightly better every time, uh, I think that, that also drives our performance over the long run. So a core philosophy while continuing to effectively tweak and, and learn lessons as, as time goes by. Now, especially over the last 10 years, the local market has not performed well. How, how much of the, the investments, the underlying investments are offshore and how, how many are local? So we've got f fairly significant flexibility to, to move between offshore and local and we've historically been mostly SA focused. Um, the, the, the part of our history where we went more aggressively offshore was post-COVID, where there was a time when it looked like South Africa would be in a in a, in a very dark space after this because we were still battling all the states. But that was only a two two years ago. Yeah, yes. So so I think before that we would have probably had ten or twenty percent of the fund offshore, and then I think during that period maybe that became thirty to fifty percent for a period of time. But we're probably back to I think twenty to thirty percent offshore right now, with the balance being in SA. If, if I look at how we're positioned right now. That, that suggests that you really did well in a period where many other asset managers actually just tread water. Um, to take us through the, the 2010s, uh, the Zuma era, what was the approach then and where were the big hits? Yeah, so, so look, it, it was certainly even for us, I think up to probably 2016, 2017, there were significant opportunities in SA, but, um, and I think, let's say, finding businesses like Capitec that was big winners, like I think a business like Clicks we identified early, there was massive opportunity left for them to grow in SA. We made good money on the property side when a lot of the SA property companies went to Eastern Europe and identified these underpenetrated property markets in Romania and Poland. So those were some, a few of the big winners. But then every year, there, oh, and, and maybe one other example was African Bank, we, we did extremely well out of African Bank post the failure there, we were the biggest buyers of the offshore bonds. And so, so basically looking where others aren't really looking, I, I don't think anyone else would have listed African Bank as one of their big winners of the, of the 2010 um, period. But I guess it shows you, I think we'll look in pockets where other people don't invest. I think from 2018 onwards, it's the first time we really felt the slowdown in, in SA um, and how it started impacting SA companies. And it did become somewhat harder to find these fantastic winners because if your economy is just growing one or one and a half percent, it's even the best uh, management teams will find it somewhat more um, more difficult to grow. So I think it's since that time we did we said let's somewhat ramp up our offshore exposure and increase our 
opportunity set so we can still make mo money in, in SA and our, on, on, on the home field, but try to supplement that with, with great ideas offshore. How would you describe the risk profile of the fund? So we would calibrate ourselves as probably around the balance fund type of risk profile. So certainly we've had lower volatility, lower drawdowns than a typical fully invested equity fund. And the reason for that is that we do apply active hedging. So we would go short indices, we go short individual shares. So we've got pockets in the fund that'll make us money when the funds go down, when, when markets go down. We typically, we are still a, a net long bar fund. So basically, if markets go down, typically the fund in the short term will pull back with that, but we will hopefully have significantly lower drawdowns than, than equity funds. If I look back at 08, I think your equity funds probably drew down 40% and we went down about 15. And again, around COVID, maybe equity funds drew down 35 and maybe we were down 10 or so at peak. So maybe somewhere between 30 and 50% of the downside you should expect to get, but hopefully we capture all or more than the more than all of the upside then, then when things go, go, go up, um, when things recover. So I, I think making sure that we protect investors on the downside and give great returns in good times is a key part of, I think, what a hedge fund brings to, to an overall mix of, of assets. A hundredfold increase over 20 years, I think it translates into annualized growth of around 23, 24%. How, how consistently did you hit that? Or were there certain patches where you just, you just absolutely blew the lights out uh, and other uh, periods where you it didn't go so well. How um, a predictable or how consistent was that growth? Yes, so so we, we've got kind of two funds. Our, our market neutral fund is, is a very consistent product that's actually never had a negative year over the 23 years it's, it's been running. Um, so that's for investors that kind of effectively want around 10% nice inflation plus 5 to 7% kind of returns with low vol. Growth does take some market risk, so your return profile will be a bit more volatile. We've had two negative years, I think 2018 um, it was down of two or three percent, and then um, 2008 in the global financial crisis, we were down, I think, around 13, 14 percent, uh, let's say mid double digits around there. So two, two out of the 23 years negative, which I think is mu much better than, than equity funds. So I think you, like investors, should expect some volatility. You're not going to hit 23 every year. You're going to have 30 or 40 percent years. You're going to have 10 percent years. You're going to have some negative years. But hopefully over time, we still think of this level, there's scope for, for us to double people's money every, every kind of five years or so is, is, is still the goal of the fund. Yeah, that's pretty aggressive. Do you think you can maintain this? Look, we, we, we're certainly doing what we've been doing consistently for the 23 years still. We've got a great team. Uh, us, we, we remain as hungry as ever. I think having the right mix of people with experience and then young people that's highly driven, talented and motivated is, is the right kind of recipe for an asset manager to maintain that drive. And uh, if I look at our team, we're certainly as pumped and, and hungry as ever to keep delivering great returns for investors. And as, as a hedge fund, it's, it's a very kind of honest story. We're not here to collect kind of base fees from clients. The fund is set up, let's say David and myself, the majority of our money is invested in, uh, with clients in the fund. So really for us, it's as much growing our own wealth as, as growing clients' wealth, which I think is a different mindset than just doing this for a job and running people's money for, for a base fee. So we only do well if clients do well. And I think that that's really the mindset here. And that's why I think we we remain driven and motivated to, to continue to generate great returns. There are three managers, if uh, how, how do you work together? Because I would imagine sometimes you don't quite agree about certain proposals and decisions that uh, is about to be taken. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's that's very insightful. And I, th I think that's a key part of managing or of, of having a great team is where you can have these thoughtful disagreements. And that's really, I think, where we think the magic happens is in these disagreements and arguing and, and fighting about something to, to get to the right answer. Because um, if we were just support the people that always agreed with us uh, effectively that there's no point, then you just have the same view. You actually want team members um, that, that will point out when, when they disagree with you and that's willing to raise their voice. So one of our core company values is a meritocracy, which means that the th let's say the three senior fund managers, we've got kind of two additional fund managers and then a team of analysts. We can all share our views equally. Everyone participates in debate. Everyone can add their opinion to, to an argument. So we want, basically we want a team set up where the best arguments and the facts wins rather than who shouts the loudest or who's necessarily been there uh, for the longest period of time. Um, and, and Dave, uh, our founder, he would typically say, look, this is a contact sport. Sometimes you go home a bit kind of battered and bruised because it's, it's been a rough day debating things and maybe you didn't quite get your way on a share. But but that really is what makes it special. And because we've worked together for a long time, you come back the next day fresh and you kind of, you, you hopefully get to the best outcome. So that's certainly a, a, a fun part, sometimes tricky, but it's a fun part of, of what we do. 
Let's talk about the, the volatile periods. The, the fund was launched uh, just virtually at the, the dot-com bubble, which burst early in the 2000s. We saw the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, which uh, was really a significant uh, you know, event in markets uh, for, for many decades. And then we've had this COVID mess we had in 2020 and 21, and currently we're also seeing some volatility in the markets. How did the fund survive those, uh, those curveballs? Yeah, look, that those are obviously the, the kind of the most tricky times running running any asset manager is, is through that those those extremely volatile and difficult periods. Um, and the interesting thing is, if, if you ask people, would you buy the market when it's down twenty? Like universally, they say yes, they would buy it. But the issue is, the market is only down twenty when some crazy event has happened and everyone's in panic. That's why it's down twenty. So it's never as easy if you get asked up front, would you buy the market down twenty versus actually buying it when it's down twenty, right? Because uh, then you just see all this bad news. So I think the two things you think of th- through these uh, volatile times is how do I protect as much of the downside for my clients as, as I can to make it easier for them to ride through this volatile period? But as importantly as how do I capture the, outs, the, the upside coming up? Because typically when shares are 30 or 40% cheaper, they don't stay that way forever. Like eventually the good companies will be priced correctly again and they will outperform. So you need to balance the right mix of effectively defense and offense to, to protect that downside using put options, using shorts, but net, not being stuck in that view, realizing that their shares are getting cheaper, they're going to turn around. Sometimes it takes longer and, and the financial crisis was probably 18 months down and, and then only the bull market started and COVID obviously it all happened in like four or five weeks. So it was much more rapid, but it's always managing those da- that downside. But then you need to be able to, you need to be willing to buy shares on the way down. The thing is people always say, I'd, I'd rather buy them when it's turning on the way up, but no one ever does because it moves too quickly on the upside. There's no uh, volume on the upside. And also when things start bouncing, you always think they kind of come back again. So in our approach is you need to be willing to take some downside. You start, when things start getting too cheap, you just got to start buying. And that's also important why, why it's important to have these long-term relationships with, with your investors that know that uh, in order to get the upside, I need to be willing to take some volatility and some downside as the attractive positions are added to the fund. And I think we're in one of those periods right now. And all market material of uh, fund managers, there's always a disclaimer, you know, past performance is not indicative of future performance. Now, obviously, obviously people will look at this and say, listen, uh, a hundredfold increase in, in the portfolio value is absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, how do you think people should expect future performance? Yes, so so we are. We, we certainly can't guarantee any performance level. The, the only thing I can say is we are as driven as we've ever been. We've got the same approach we've used that's generated returns in the previous 23 years. And I think it's actually been a like if you look at SA, as you touched on earlier, we've been through the like the EM crisis that when we just launched the funds, then then the tech then the tech kind of tech bubble bursting, global financial crisis, the state capture story, COVID, and now the Russian crisis. So I think it's really been put to the test in various different circumstances, and and I think protected downside and delivered returns in, in that entire period. So so we're certainly going to kind of attempt to do that, and hopefully, I mean, we're we're at a hundred times money now. If, if we can keep doubling clients money every four or five years, hopefully that means we get to 200 times in, in a few years time. And, and hopefully um, there's a chance I can still see 500 and hopefully eventually a thousand times if we can keep delivering. So that's certainly what we what we kind of aiming for is to to hopefully add another zero to, to this uh, 100 times uh, in, in time. Well, Jock, thank you so much for chatting to us today and congratulations. I think it's, uh, it's a really, really uh, a good uh, I think box to tick in South Africa. It's the first fund that uh, has crossed this level. I don't know if there's a club for uh, 100 baggers, but uh, hopefully we see a few more and maybe from the Peregrine stable. That was Jock Conradi, the CEO and a portfolio manager at Peregrine Capital.